How's it going? Good, thank good. good. I didn't know this was like the first time that you guys were doing an event, so I feel like the pressure is kind of on, but <laughs> we'll, we'll do our best here. So, Okay, great. So as Claire mentioned, my name is Lindsay, and I work at Dynamic Catholic in Cincinnati. Anyone familiar with like Matthew Kelly, Australian dude? All right, okay, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. So um, perfect. I want to start by giving a quick poll of the room by show of hands. How many of you guys are graduated high school and either going into college here in a couple months or maybe going to take a couple of years off and do work, but just graduate high school, not quite yet going into college? All right, how about sophomores? No sophomores? You look uncertain. Yeah. Okay, great. Sophomores, juniors? Going to be a junior this year? No juniors. Wow. All right, seniors. All right, great. Okay, perfect. Seniors, real quick, something you should know. On your graduation day, everyone is going to be saying this phrase. They're going to say, it isn't over. And I remember on my, on my graduation day, all of the staff, all the professors, they just kept going up and hugging us all and being like, it's not over, it's not over. And I, I was like, man, like, I like that. That's super sentimental. It's not over. But then I realized a couple months later what they meant was, it's not over for the college taking your money, <laughs> right? Because you may not be paying tuition anymore, but now you're an alumni, right? Which means they're gonna send the fundraisers after you. And so then like all of us alumni, right? We're, we still got debt, we've got student loans, and they send like these fundraising tigers out on us, and we're just like wounded gazelle, just like limping, <laughs> trying to get away, and they're like coming after us, right? I remember three months after I graduated, I'm living at home, I'm earning below minimum wage, and I'm pouring coffee for soccer moms, so clearly I'm loaded. <laughs> and they call me and they ask me, would you like to donate to the college? And I tried to explain to them, you know, like, I'd really like to. Um, my yacht is currently under repair, so things are a little tight right now. And they said, could you just dig deep in your heart, deep in your pockets, and, and see what you can send? I'm like, all right, I'll dig deep send you whatever I can find. So they got three Skittles and a gum wrapper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so tonight we are here to talk about faith while away from home, particularly faith in college, but I think a lot of the things we're going to talk about tonight can be applied to faith just in general away from home. And I want to start tonight by telling you guys about Paul Lamborghini. Now, Paul Lamborghini lives in Egan, Minnesota with his three boys. And Egan is up near these beautiful forests, these beautiful parks up in Eden, Minnesota. And when Paul's oldest son, DJ, turned 12, uh, well, I'm sorry, turned 13, he was still 12 the night before he turned 13, Paul goes to DJ and says, grab your coat, get in the car. And DJ says, Dad, where are we going? He says, can't tell you, just get in the car. So Paul and DJ get in the car and they drive, and the whole drive, DJ's asking his father, Dad, where are we going, where are we going? And, and Paul won't answer. And finally, they get into the middle of this forest, in the Egan forests, and Paul takes DJ and sets him on a stump, and he says, tomorrow you're going to be 13. This is your test to become a man. He hands him a blindfold. He says, I need you to put on this blindfold and sit on this stump all night. And if you can stay on this stump without leaving all night, then you're a man. I need you to do this for me, son. This is your test to become a man. He says, I'm going to go, I'll come pick you up in the morning, if you're still here on this stump, you're a man. So he hands DJ the blindfold, Paul, gets in it. Paul, Paul walks away, and DJ puts on this blindfold and sits on the stump, and he's terrified. And it's dusk, night falls, the, the sounds start, right? You start hearing the crunching of the leaves, you start hearing the owls crying, you start hearing all these other animals, all these other noises. And, and DJ is sitting there with his blindfold on, and all he wants to do is run. All he wants to do is go and scream. But he's like, I've got to be a man. I've got to be a man. I've got to do this. And all night, his little legs, they just want to jump off of this stump. He's like, I've got to be a man. I've got to do this. Now around 3 in the morning, DJ starts remembering all of the ghost stories he used to hear when he was a kid. And that just frightens him even more. And then around 4 in the morning, finally, he starts to fall asleep, slumped over sitting up in this stump. And when he opens his eyes, he can see the sunlight peeking through the blindfold, so he knows he made it. He's like, I did it, I'm a man. 
and he takes off his blindfold and he sees his dad camped out not seven yards away where he'd been all night. And Paul walks up to DJ and he says, were you scared? And DJ said, yeah. He's like, did you want to run? He's like, yeah. He's like, did you think you were alone? And DJ's like, yeah. And his father said, son, I would never leave you. I would never do that to you. I would never leave you. He said, but I need you to know this. Sometimes you feel alone. Sometimes you think no one else is there. And sometimes you think you've been abandoned. But know that God is always watching. God is your father, and he would never leave you abandoned. This is a really, like, radical example, right? <clears throat> and I don't mean to say that college sometimes feels like being blindfolded in the middle of the woods, but sometimes college feels like being blindfolded in the middle of the woods, right? College is a lot like the woods, or at least my college is a lot like the woods. Like, it's dark, there's squirrels everywhere, like, you hear these weird mating calls, and it's like, what is going on? Right? And sometimes we can get so wrapped up in that, so, so nervous by all of that, that we forget that God is literally right there and that he will never leave our side. Sometimes it's so weird that a campus, for a place that has thousands of people, can feel so empty and so alone. So what I want to talk to you guys about tonight is, is in those times, right? And college isn't just doom and gloom. College is awesome. I had made great memories while in college. I've made great memories since being away from home and working. But in those times when things are uncertain, when you've got exams, when you've got tests, when you've got difficult decisions, difficult relationships, and you think that you are just feeling so overwhelmed, sometimes it's, it's nice to remember that if you just take off your blindfold, you realize God is there, right? So I went to college at a secular school on the outskirts of the Bible Belt. And going to college at a secular school on the outskirts of the Bible Belt would be difficult for any Catholic. But it wasn't hard for me, because I was Protestant. So at this point, you might be wondering, why in the world am I at a talk on staying Catholic while at college, and the talk is being given by someone who was a Protestant until their senior year? I think that's a good question. And the answer is this. I converted my senior year. I did college without Catholicism. And I can tell you that it sucks. I did the whole school thing without the, without the Catholic faith, without that source of sustenance and strength. And I can tell you that it's hard and it's difficult. And I can tell you this in the hopes that you will never, ever have to experience it for yourselves. And I can also tell you that the semester where I was, Catholic in college, was the most beautiful, amazing experience of my life. Not because things suddenly got easy, but because I had this source of faith and strength and the sustenance with which I knew I could handle anything. So now, obviously working at Dynamic Catholic, I work with a lot of Catholics, and, and a question I always get from people is, oh, were you a cradle Catholic? It's like, no, I was a pagan baby, <laughs> right? But really, I mean, no, I was, I was a Christian. I was a church-going Christian growing up. I was a Protestant. And I really did crave a deep and meaningful relationship with God. But I didn't have the fullness of that faith that you find in the Catholic Church. And in reality, I actually defied the fullness of that faith that you have in the Catholic Church. My sister, she went, she went to college before me, and I'll, I'll never forget, she called home one day, and, and we're talking to her, and she's like, yep, yep. College is great, making tons of friends, everything's what classes are written. Oh, by the way, I'm becoming Catholic. And she like hung up the phone and that was it, right? I was mad. I was livid. Because Protestants, what do we believe? We believe that the Eucharist is a symbol. Right? We believe that Jesus gave us bread and wine as a symbol for his, his love for us, as a symbol of his sacrifice for us. But Catholics, you Catholics think that the, the bread and wine become the actual body and blood of Christ. And not only that, but then you consume that. How, how could Catholics think something so, so weird, so morbid? I was baffled by this idea. And then to hear that my own sister was going to become Catholic, I felt betrayed. I felt angry. And I'll never forget when, I, when it came my turn to go to college. My mom dropped me off and she goes, okay, don't become Catholic. <laughs> and I was like, ha, ha, don't you worry. Because I didn't want anything to do with that. 
So in college, I was pretty active in a Protestant Bible study. I went to church every so often. In my junior year, I decided that I wanted to study abroad, and I decided that I would study abroad in Italy. And about a month before going, I started getting really, really sick. My hair was falling out. I was constantly having stomach aches and headaches. My weight was fluctuating like crazy, and I went to all these doctors, and they could not figure out what was wrong with me. And so finally, one month before I leave for Italy, my doctor decides to run one last test. And I'll never forget, he comes in the room, and he's got this amazing smile on his face. He's like, Lindsay, we know what's wrong with you. And I'm like, do tell. <laughs> and he's like, you have celiac disease, which means that you can never eat wheat, rye, barley, or soy for the rest of your life. And you can never eat anything that comes in contact with wheat, rye, barley, or soy for the rest of your life. And if you do, your body will literally attack itself until you writhe in pain and could potentially lead to lupus, cancer, Alzheimer's, and infertility. And I'm like, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because that means I can't eat what we commonly refer to as gluten, right? And I'm going to Italy, the land of pizza, pasta, bread, whatever you want. It's gluten. And so I'm going to this country where I can't eat any of their basically major food groups. So I pack my suitcase and I pack four gluten-free granola bars. And I was going to be gone for four months. So I've got a ration, right? <laughs> Fantastic weight loss plan. But then I get there and I realize that, that Italians have these other things that are gluten-free um, called fruits and vegetables. So I started eating those too, and as you can imagine, I was pretty miserable. Uh, but but it, was, it was also, it was difficult for me because any kind of social gathering for students in Italy is basically like, come eat bread. And I'm just like, not very good at that anymore. So Lent comes when I'm studying abroad. And like a good Protestant, I start to brainstorm things I'm going to do for lunch. And I'm like, I'm going to give up bread. <laughs> and then I'm like, no, it's probably cheating. So I decided I'm going to give up 30 minutes a day, every day, to pray in a church. 30 minutes a day, every day, to pray in a church. So I get out my map of Florence. Florence, Italy, not Florence, Kentucky. I get out my map of Florence. And I'm like, all right, Protestant churches. Protestant churches. And there are no Protestant churches in Florence, Italy. So I'm like, all right, I'll go to a Catholic church for my 30 minutes of prayer every day. I can do that. I can pray in a church for 30 minutes every day, even though it's Catholic. So I go every day to these Catholic churches, and the first thought I would have when I would walk in is like, wow, this is a really pretty church, even though it's Catholic. <laughs> you know, and I'd like, I'd go sit down in the pew and I'd be like, this is a nice pew, even though it's Catholic. <laughs> and I'd have those 30 minutes a day. And through those 30 minutes a day, every day, something quietly began to unfold. You see, there was this thing in the Catholic churches I'd never seen before in my life, really intrigued me. It was these, this gold box. Every church, no matter which one I went into, had this gold box with a red candle near it. And I didn't know what the heck this thing was, but somehow, when I sit down and I pray in front of that gold box, I felt fulfilled. Somehow the pain, the hunger, the sickness I was feeling went away for those 30 minutes a day as I sat in front of that gold box and that red candle. And I'll never forget one day, I, I sat down for my 30 minutes and I opened my Bible, and it opened to Psalm 73. My eye fell on verse 26, which says, Though my flesh and my heart may fail, the Lord is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Though my flesh and my heart may fail, the Lord is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And in reading that, for the first time, I thought of God as my spiritual food. I realized that I had been so fulfilled in this time of prayer and that God was somehow feeding me in this time. <clears throat> And so that hunger continued to grow, but it didn't stop there. See, one morning, a couple weeks later, I woke up at 6 a.m. I don't wake up at 6 a.m., but I woke up at 6 a.m. starving, spiritually starving, for my 30 minutes of prayer. So I go out at 6 a.m., and I walk into the first church I see. And there at the end of the aisle at 6 a.m. in the corner of the church is a private mass being said by an American priest. And he's got about five nuns there with him. And I was pretty interested, and I said, I'll go see what this guy has to say. And I walked up just as 
he is reading the gospel for the day, which happened to be from John chapter 6. And I stood there in awe as I heard this, church, this priest read. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. At this point, I got a little uncomfortable. I'm like, this is pretty Catholic. I should get out of here. But the priest continued. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And then I try to do this, like, self-soothing, where I'm like, he's just speaking symbolically, Jesus is just talking symbolically, so okay. And then the priest continues, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. He who feeds on me will live because of me. He who eats this bread will live forever. And I thought, son of a gun, I want to be Catholic. <laughs> because at that moment, at that moment, for the first time in my life, I had this craving. I realized that I had just been experiencing a taste, a taste of what God wanted to feed me. And in that moment, I realized I didn't care anymore about my disease. I didn't care about the bread of the world. The world could keep... It's bread. I didn't want that. I wanted the bread of life. I wanted the body and blood of Christ. I wanted the Eucharist. And one year later, I received that Eucharist, and I became Catholic. Now, I wish I could tell you that it was easy to go back to my U.S. campus on the outskirts of the Bible Belt and become Catholic. But it was not easy, because sometimes, when you're Catholic, and you're living out your Catholic beliefs and you're living out your Catholic ideals, people look at you like you're kind of crazy, right? Maybe you go to a Catholic college, maybe you go to a secular college, maybe you work for a Catholic company, maybe you work for a secular company. The challenges are still there, right? Because just by being Catholic, just by living out your faith, you've got a mark on your back, and people know the core of who you are. And for some people, they just don't understand it. I don't know if your, your colleges have uh, events to welcome new freshmen. Mine, mine like to host a lot. We hosted this one thing called um, Beta Fish Bingo, which is where all the freshmen would come and play bingo, but instead of prizes, we give them beta fish. Like, this is a great idea. Let's take a bunch of people who have never had to take care of anything in their lives and give them a living creature and just see what happens. Right? It's like this weird beta test with beta fish. And I remember, like, my, my dorm neighbor's betta fish was living on a strict diet of vodka and breadcrumbs. <laughs> and so I, re I stole it. I rescued it. He says I stole it. I rescued that fish. Gave it fresh food. Gave it fresh water. Here's the thing. That fish lived for two months on vodka and breadcrumbs. The minute I gave it fresh water, it died, so it must have been an alcoholic as mine. <laughs> right? But one of the other... <laughs> one of the other things that we hosted is called a silent disco. Anyone ever heard of the silent disco? Silent discos? Yeah. <coughs> silent disco, for those of you who don't know, it's a dance, but instead of playing the music on loudspeakers like other dances, everyone has a set of headphones, and you're listening to the music in your headphones. So it's like a completely normal dance if you've got your headphones in, and everyone's just like going around, this is my dance. <laughs> I was not popular in college. Um, so if you have your headphones, you're dancing to music. If you don't have your headphones on, you are literally looking at a room of people dancing to absolutely nothing. <laughs> Sometimes that is what being Catholic can feel like, right? We've got our headphones and we are jamming. We know what we're dancing to. And to people on the outside, we're lunatics dancing to nothing, worshiping nothing, praying to nothing, right? But if you put in those headphones, if you take off that blindfold, you see a God who, is, who just loves you so much. You see a God who's watching over you. You see the capital T, truth. You see beauty and genius and something that is bigger than yourself. You see someone who loves you. But it's not always easy to dance to that beat, right? Sometimes it's hard when no one else around you is dancing, to be that person. A recent study of Catholic high schoolers showed that within four years after graduating, 90% of them 
whether they went to college, whether they didn't go to college, 90% of them would stop practicing their faith in the next four years. 90% of high schoolers, Catholic high schoolers, would stop practicing their faith within four years. Now lucky for me, I work with a ton of people, a ton of Catholics who made it through college with their faith intact, who are still living out their faith. And so in preparation for this talk, I reached out to them and I asked them two questions. The first question was, what is one thing you wish you had known or done as a Catholic in college? And the second question I asked was, if you could give any piece of advice to a young adult on keeping their faith while away from home, what would you tell them? And their responses overwhelmingly pointed toward three things, three keys towards keeping the faith while away from home. And I want to share each of those three things with you guys today. So the first key to keeping your faith while away from home is prayer. Prayer, time with God. Now sometimes when we think of prayer, we think it has to be this big, elaborate thing that we do only on our knees and we have our hands exactly like this and we use thou shalt, wilts, and everything else, right? But prayer in reality is just a dialogue with God. Prayer is a conversation with, dog, a, with God, a dialogue, not a dog, a dialogue, <laughs> not a monologue, right? Because a monologue is where you just speak. A monologue is where you say, listen, Lord, your servant speaking. A dialogue is where you converse with God and then you sit in silence to hear what God is saying to you. But sometimes we don't like silence, right? Because silence, silence, kind of, silence is kind of awkward. We don't like silence. It's so awkward. It's so uncomfortable. But here's the thing about silence is it gives us incredible clarity. Silence gives us that time to hear the voice of God. Let me show you what I mean. You're driving down the road, and you are just jamming to the Milana soundtrack. <laughs> right? I know. I know you do it. You're jamming to Moana, and you realize you, you took a wrong turn somewhere. You get lost. What do you do? You turn down Moana. You're like, girl, I appreciate you. Let's chat later. You turn her down, right? Or you're, you're on spring break, and you're on a road trip with all your friends, and they're all in the back goofing off, joking, laughing, screaming, and you realize you're lost. What do you do? You tell them, hey. Be quiet for a minute. I need to focus. I need to reorient myself and figure out where I am. Isn't prayer kind of the same? Prayer is that, that, that classroom of silence, that turning down the noise, blocking out the distractions so we can hear and focus and get back in touch with where we are. And that time, that's one of the keys of the time, right? The time, the daily routine of having that silence. <clears throat> Maybe you guys haven't experienced this, maybe I'm the only one, but like, if I do not have a routine, a set time, and a set place to pray, it doesn't happen. If I don't know, okay, at noon every day, I'm going to go ahead and have 30 minutes of prayer with God, it doesn't happen until late at night, I'm about to go to bed, and I'm like, oh, forgot to pray today. So then I do what I call a horizontal rosary, which is where you say your rosary while lying in bed, you know, and every time I think it's a good idea, I'm like, oh. Five mysteries, I can crank this out in no time. I'll close my eyes, get the meditative effect going. I'm not even for the, through the first Hail Mary, and I am just out. And I think like subconsciously, I know this, and I feel guilty, because every time I do this without fail, I will wake up four or five times in the middle of the night, and I will just sit up and go, the fourth joyful mystery! <laughs> and then I just like go straight back down, and I fall asleep. And then the next morning, I have to play the game called Beads in the Bed, which is where you're like feeling through the sheets, like trying to figure out where they went, you know? This is what happens to me if I don't have a daily time. Maybe y'all don't need it. Kudos. I like, I need that. Or else the horizontal rosary happens. But prayer is so fundamental to our well-being, spiritually and physically. Right? St. Padre Pio says, prayer is oxygen for the soul. Prayer is oxygen for the soul. I don't know if any of you guys have traveled, but if you have, you've probably heard the, like the flight stewards routine when they get on and they're like, in the case of an emergency landing, it's like, call it what it is, it's a crash. <laughs> it's not an emergency landing. You know, but then 
whatever. They tell you all this stuff, and then before they tell you the stuff to do when you're about to die, they go to some less serious stuff, which is if we experience a change in cabin pressure, what happens? The oxygen masks fall down. You've got the rubber jungle. It's all falling down, you know? And they say, place the mask over your nose and mouth, make sure the tube is fully extended, and start breathing normally between screens. <laughs> right? And they did research, airlines did research on what happens if you don't do this, if you don't have oxygen for too long. And what they found is one of two things can happen. Number one, you can become hysterical for no reason. You can think that everything around you is funny. And then 20 seconds later, you lose, conscious, lose consciousness. And then 10 seconds later, you lose uh, control of your mental faculties. And then every second after that, you get closer to permanent brain damage or death. The second thing that can happen to you if you don't have oxygen for too long, is you can become delusional and you can start hallucinating. And then they find that people become violent because of their hallucinations if you don't have oxygen. Think about your college campus for a second. Think about turning on the news. Think about the world around you. Do you see a lot of hysteria? Do you see a lot of delusion? Do you see a lot of violence? It's because our, our society, our world, doesn't have that oxygen, doesn't have that prayer. For those of you who haven't gotten to, to college yet, let me tell you, there's a ton of delusion and hysteria on campus. Like, college is the only place where you can cry or sleep wherever you want and no one cares. <laughs> everyone just kind of understands, right? Like, you're just like in the cafe and just bawling, and everyone gets it. They just want to find like, <laughs> right? But prayer is oxygen for the soul. Something interesting, airlines always tell you this. If your bag does not inflate, if you're using your mask and your bag does not inflate, don't panic. Don't steal your neighbor's mask. Oxygen is still flowing. Sometimes I go to prayer and I don't feel like my bag is inflating. Sometimes I have that silence with God and I don't hear anything from him. St. Teresa of Calcutta had the same thing for 20 years. She struggled with what she called this darkness, where she wasn't hearing anything from God. And sometimes we might experience that, even when we're being intentional with a daily routine of prayer. We might have it where our bag's just not inflating, or at least we don't feel like it is. But it's important to stay, to stick to that routine, and to trust, even though we can't see, he is there with us. It's so important to have that daily habit of prayer. Think about a time in your life where you've really been rocking it. You, you're whipping out your rosary beads, you're doing novenas, you're just conversing with God. How is everything else in your life going at that point? How did you feel strong? Did you feel like you had something, some sustenance to lean on? Think about a time in your life where maybe your prayer life wasn't so great. How did things feel then? Were you able to cope with things? How were you able to respond to everything that was happening in the world around you? And maybe you're trying to remember and you think, gosh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I've ever had a daily habit of prayer. That's okay. Today, choose one thing. One thing that you can do to get closer to that daily habit. Don't feel like you have to do too much, right? You don't have to pray three rosaries a day, right? We're, we're not monks. We're, we're, we're college kids. We're young adults. We're living in the world. Like, we, we can't hold ourselves to something where then we feel just defeated. Maybe for you, it's starting your day with 10 minutes of prayer every morning. Maybe it's ending your day by thanking God for all the blessings that he gave you that day. Or maybe it's just saying, Jesus, I trust in you every time something gets rough during the day. Try to find something that will help you get closer to a daily habit of prayer because that will give you the oxygen and the strength you need to face all the things that you face in the adult world. So the first key to keeping the faith while away from home is prayer. The second key to keeping the faith while away from home is friendship. Because who we become friends with can greatly impact how we handle all the things in this journey, right? St. Thomas Aquinas 
has this great definition I love. He says that love, in the context of a romantic relationship, in the context of a friendship, love is to will the good of the other. He says to love is to will the good of the other. So if I'm your friend and I love you, that means I'm going to will your good. That means I'm going to do things that help you become the best version of yourself. That means I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to support you, I'm going to challenge you to be the person God made you to be because I love you, because I'm your friend. If I'm not your friend in that true sense of the word, maybe I encourage you to do things that make you a second version of yourself, a second-rate version of yourself, some lesser version of yourself, someone that God's not calling you to be. Maybe I pressure you to do things that you don't really want to do, but I say, hey, I'm your friend. I don't know why I did this. <laughs> I was not popular in college. <laughs> uh, anyway, like, sometimes we can really analyze, does this person really love me? Well, are they willing my good? I, my best friend in college, his name is Brett, and Brett loved him, but he's one of those people that you kind of secretly hate, because like, he doesn't have to try. And he just aces everything. I mean, this kid had a full tuition scholarship, engineering student, straight A's, would not study. I don't think he ever opened a textbook the whole time in college, and yet he would always beat me in grades. But I loved Brett. And, uh, we grew really close because he was a leader in my Bible study, and so we had a really good time. We came in as freshmen together, and, and we would have Bible study on Tuesday nights. All of us in our dorm room, we'd all get, get together, all our friends, and we'd have Bible study on Tuesday nights. And a couple months into freshman year, we noticed that after Bible study, Brett would slip out. He'd leave, and we weren't quite sure where he was going. And a couple weeks later, we figured out that Brett after Bible study, was leaving and going to the fraternity house down the road where they had drinking games every Tuesday night. When we found this out, we confronted him. We're like, you're Brett. You think BYOB is bring your own Bible. Like, what are you doing? And he just shrugged. He's like, they're my friends. We told him we were concerned, but he just kept saying again and again, they're my friends. They're my friends. We have fun. And so Brett would continue doing this. Month after month, semester after semester, we'd have Bible study. He'd leave. We wouldn't see him again. He'd come in class the next morning wearing the same clothes he was wearing last night, ace the test hungover, and then leave. And then the next Tuesday, we'd do it again and again and again. One night my junior year, I get a phone call. And Brett's in jail. He'd gone out drinking with his friends. And next thing he knows, he opens his eyes and it's 3 a.m. and he's in the campus recreation center. And he's screaming bloody murder and the alarms are all going off. He completely busted the glass door and gotten in. And the police are there handcuffing him. And that was all he knew. I walked with Brett that next semester as he went to court, as he had to do his community service hours. I watched him just so scared that he would lose his scholarship. And then because he thought maybe he would lose his scholarship, he got a job at a gas station, and I walked with him when they fired him from that gas station when they found out he had criminal record. And then I realized, you get one phone call when you're in jail, right? You get one phone call. And when you have one phone call and it's your drinking buddy stacked up against your Bible study friends, who are you going to call? Now, Brett, it's been about three years since this happened. Brett has been sober for three years. He got married last year, and they wanted a really small wedding, so they invited 30 people. And I sat there, and I looked around the room at the other 29 people, and I couldn't help but notice who wasn't there. Right? I couldn't help but notice that the people who were there were the people who always challenged Brett, who, who wanted him to become the best version of himself, but the people who weren't there, they were the people who got him into that mess. So when you look at your friendships, when you're choosing your friendships, when you're building your friendships, are you hanging out with the people who are going to help you become a better person, who want to see you thrive? who support you in your faith and are like, hey, let's talk about God. Let's do this thing. Let's, let's, let's 
go to Bible studies. Let's pray together. Right? Are your friends like Andrew, who, after he met Jesus, went to his brother Peter and was like, dude, you have got to come meet this guy I just met. He is insanely awesome. I think that's the like, Hebrew translation of the Bible. <laughs> Do you have friends like the paralytic, who literally removed a roof and lowered their friend on a mat so Jesus could heal him? Right? When we're looking at our friendships, are our friends helping us to grow in the faith? Are they challenging us? Are they helping us to become that best version of ourselves? And maybe you think about it and you're like, gosh, I don't really have any great friends. That's where my colleagues also offered some assistance. They said, one of the best things I did in college was to join Catholic groups, was to find masses where a lot of students were attending, was to frequent the Newman Center on campus. And if there wasn't a Catholic Bible study, I started one. Because when you do that, you meet other people who want to know and love and follow God. You meet other people who want to be the best versions of themselves. You find your tribe. You find the people who are going to roll with you through thick and thin. All right, so the first key to keeping the faith wall away from home is prayer, right? Second key is friendship. That's not so hard. I just finished that one. And then the third key, the third key to keeping the faith wall away from home is frequent reception of the sacraments. Frequent reception of the sacraments. Now, when Jesus established the sacrament of confession, I think confession is a good one, to start with. When he established the sacrament of confession, he did not do it because he wanted to give you one more thing to do. Right? He did not do it because he wanted you to feel like a horrible person. Jesus established the sacrament of reconciliation because he knew you would need a place to receive healing, that you would need a place to receive strength, and he wanted to be able to give you that place. Right? Because going to confession is like going to the doctor. It's examining your life, finding the pain points, and then going to Jesus and telling him what hurts. So then earlier this week, I kid you not, happened this week, my friend stabbed herself in the eyeball with a safety pin. How you do that, I'm not quite sure, uh, but she did. And she comes to her and her eye is all swollen, and we're like, dude, go to the doctor. Get out of here. Go, go, go to tell someone what happened, and she... She was so embarrassed, but can you imagine if she said, no, they'll judge me. They'll think I'm a horrible, they're going to laugh at me. I'm too embarrassed to go. What would happen? Her eye would continue to swell. She'd develop an infection, and then she'd probably be facing way worse problems than she started with. Sometimes our sins feel super embarrassing. Or sometimes they feel really small and insignificant. Sometimes it's like, mm, that doesn't really matter. It's such a small thing. I don't need to go confess it. But nothing is neutral to the soul. Nothing is neutral to the soul. Everything we do, in some way, impacts our heart, impacts our holiness. And if we just sweep the little things under the rug and continually just try to push it aside, eventually those effects are going to compound and we're going to have emotional baggage that we're just not ready to carry on our own. So Father Meyer, he's not here, I wish he was, he would have loved this. He has a great homily on confession. And is it, in it he says, you cannot get better, you cannot improve, if you're not willing to acknowledge your weaknesses. Right, now confession is a place of victory, not condemnation. It's a place of victory, not condemnation, because confession is the place that you can go and say, hey, I tried. I tried to live this life. I tried to follow God, and I fell, and I stumbled, and I struggled, and I need help. I need, I need to get back up. I need to walk on. It is that place where the priest, acting in the person of Christ, can absolve you of those sins. And you can go forth with that strength and that healing. It's an incredible place of victory. So confession number one. I encourage you guys, when you're away from home, try to get to confession once a month. That may seem like a lot, but I think if you go once a month, you'll find it's just an incredible experience. And every time you find that you get stronger and stronger and your willpower against temptation gets stronger and stronger. So the first sacrament I, I recommend frequently is confession. 
confession. The second one is the Eucharist. For a lot of you guys who are going to college, this may be the first time in your life that you haven't had someone shake you awake on Sunday and say, hey, time to go to Mass. Maybe for the first time in your life, this is, this is the time where you wake up and it's Sunday morning and you can choose what you want to do. And I'll tell you this, when you wake up and it's Sunday morning and you're exhausted because you just wrote four papers and you pulled three all-nighters and you had a heck of a time the other night, getting up, you have to fly. Sorry, I'm not, it's weird. You have two options before you when you're in that situation and you wake up. I've done both. Option one, you sleep in. You roll out of bed in the afternoon just as the dining hall stops serving brunch. So you make yourself some microwave oatmeal and you watch Hallmark Channel. Option two, you get up. You go to Mass and you receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins. Now in that light, it may seem pretty black and white, right? But when you're in the moment and you're exhausted, there's so much going on. It takes a lot of strength to make that decision, but I tell you, every time you make that decision, it gets a lot easier the next time, and the next time, and the next time. And I don't know about you, but if I've got a huge exam coming up, I think I can get up a heck of a lot more strength from the Eucharist than from watching Full House reruns. Right? So I encourage people to go to Mass, not just on Sundays if you can, but if you can even before class. I think that's such a wonderful thing to do. I received the Eucharist for the first time on March 26, 2016. And the minute, the minute, the second, the body and blood of Jesus Christ touched my, my tongue, I was shaken. Because in that moment I realized if God if God who sits on the heavenly throne, if God above the all-powerful, almighty, big as he is, gives himself to me in something so small, so mild as a host, what can I not expect from him? If God gives his very self to me, what strength can I not get from him? If you let the Eucharist be your sustenance, you'll be able to take on anything in college and beyond. If you let the Eucharist be your sustenance and your source of strength, you can take on anything. So now here's what we're going to do. Well, first, I want to say this, because I've been on both sides. Protestant churches, they may have awesome music. They may have amazing coffee. It's not that good. They may have the best worship service, the best facilities. They may have every kind of amenity you would want, but there's one thing they will never, ever, ever be able to give you, and that is what you receive when you go to Mass. That is God himself. In John 6, a little further than what I read earlier, verse 68, after Jesus has finished his bread of life discourse, a lot of people around him say, this is too much, the saying is too hard. Who can believe it? And so a lot of the people who were following Jesus at that time walked away. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, Will you leave too? And Peter looks at Jesus and he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Lord, to whom shall we go? Lord, to whom shall I go? You have... You have everything that I could possibly need right now to face this challenge I'm experiencing. Lord, to whom shall I go? You alone can give me the strength to handle this. Lord, to whom shall I go? You alone are my source of life, my source of strength, my source of wisdom, my everything. If you let the Eucharist be your sustenance, you can take on anything. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop talking for 10 minutes. Some of you guys look too excited. <laughs> We're going to do some Q&A because I want to give you guys the opportunity to ask questions. If there's something that you're experiencing, if there's something you're wondering, if there's something that's been weighing on your heart maybe for a while, or something you just thought of today, I want to give you the chance to bring those questions forward. And then I'll do my best to answer those questions. So I guess I lied. I'm not going to stop talking. But here's the thing. If, if you have had an experience that you think like, man, I felt that. I dealt with that. And you think you have something 
valuable to share with everyone that could help your brothers and sisters in Christ. Be like, hey, I did, I, here's what I did. This is what helped me in that. I want to give you guys the opportunity to share that too. So we'll do that for 10 or so minutes. Then I'll come back and say some really inspiring things. <laughs> and then we'll go and we will adore our Lord and Savior. So that being said, does anyone have questions? This is, this is that awkward silence thing we were talking about. Yeah? I have a question. So, uh, my mom was not Catholic raised, when she was raised, so she had a lot of trouble with Mary. How did you come to be comfortable and familiar with saying the rosary every day, horizontal or otherwise? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's such a good question. So I talked earlier about the importance of friendship, right? And one of the key things for me, becoming Catholic, was two girls that I met in a Catholic Bible study. We were in Italy, and I didn't have any Protestant Bible study options, and so I was like, I'll join this Bible study, even though it's Catholic. <laughs> right? And I met these two awesome girls and they just answered my questions patiently, lovingly. And one of my big things was Mary. So they didn't dive into all this theology, right? They didn't, they didn't go crazy on me and, and, and go all apologetics on me. They just said, well, do you want to pray rosary together? So I prayed my first rosary with them. And I liked it. So the next day I went up to them and I said, hey, can we pray rosary again? And they're like, yeah. So we did it again, and again, and again, and one day we were traveling, and we were in the south of Italy, we were, we were on a road trip, and we got horribly lost. We were walking through these mountains, and there's this village built into the side of a cliff, and we're walking through trying to find our, our bed and breakfast for the night. They call us and say, we're going to close in like 10 minutes, so, you know, and I'm just like, that was a horrible Italian accent, that's not really <laughs> Anyway, we're just lost. We don't know where we are. They tell us, if you're not here in 10 minutes, you're sleeping on the streets tonight. And my friend goes, Mother Mary, please pray for us. And I was like, I was tired. I was fed up. And in my head, I'm like, man, why are you talking to Mary? Like, talk to Jesus. Come on. You know, like, what are you doing? Why are you asking her to pray for you? Why are you doing this? I didn't say any of that out loud, but I was thinking it. And literally, not two seconds later, we turned the corner and in the side of the cliff is a statue of Mary with a bunch of candles around it. Just a statue that someone had put there, I don't know, 20 years ago. And someone just kept coming every day and lighting a candle. And that statue of Mary had her arms outstretched like this and underneath was a little arch right underneath her. And at the bottom of the arch was the entrance to our bed and breakfast. And I was like, Thanks, Mary. <laughs> I have a picture of this arch. I have this picture. Because it was the moment I was like, wow, Mary, man. So that's like a personal example. But I think the real answer to your question is like friends. Like for me, it was friends. Um, does anyone else have reflections on that or other questions even? Or do you have follow-up questions? We can Other questions? How, yeah. did you, how did your uh, family take you living Catholic? It's a great question. They were very, very supportive. Um, I'm very blessed that my parents were extremely supportive of me becoming Catholic. My sister was ecstatic, obviously, because I had been like cursing her out for being a Catholic for a couple of years, and now she just kind of got to be like, I told you so. Um, my family was very, very supportive, but I have a lot of friends who are converts, and their families were not supportive. And that's hard, right? I don't know if any of you guys out here have family, parents, anyone that you're close to who doesn't share your belief. And that's really hard. But I think there's a beautiful opportunity in that. A beautiful opportunity to not necessarily shove it down their throats and try to evangelize, but just evangelize with love. I'll never forget the time I was still living at home and it was a weekday and I got up early and I said, okay, I'm gonna go to mass. And my mom's like, it's Tuesday. I said, yeah, why not? And I did that a couple, couple days every week. And finally one day she came to me, she's like, man, like that just, that's incredible. You do that. 
And in that little moment, there is an opportunity to just show her, I'm getting fulfillment when I go to Mass. I'm, I'm with Jesus. Something that I didn't used to have, I now have, and I treasure that. So, they were very supportive. Short answer. You're like inhaling, so I was like, oh, he's got a question. Well, I had a question, but she answered mine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> What are some of like the biggest struggles you guys are facing if you're at college or just out of high school or working? Like, what are some of the things that are just like? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna be a senior, but like my first two years at my college is hard because I never found that person to go two things with me, and I went to I studied abroad in Ireland, and that's where I I was I was a I was a pretty hardcore Catholic before I went, but. I was like, I'm like really now hardcore Catholic, you know? <laughs> and so like when I came back, like when I went there, I found friends who like were those authentic friendships who like showed me what, um, like how you're saying, like r truly cared about you and like helped you grow in your faith. And the one thing that they taught me was about inviting people. So when I came back to America, I was like, I honestly didn't know that there was a, like a, like a ministry on my campus. So I was like, I want to start one kind of thing. And I go, and then I was like, talk to someone. They're like, we have one. I was like, what the heck? Why did I hear about this? <laughs> and so like my big thing this past year was like being inviting and like asking people to go to Mass with me or like to go to these events. So like your freshman year, try to find those um, people to just go to Mass on Sunday and then ask, ask them, be like, hey, you want to go to this like Bible study or something like that? It's because... No one really wants to show up by themselves to things like it's not our nature to be alone. Like friends are everything, and if you can find those friends to go to, just, even to the Sunday mass is a huge difference, and you'll get a lot more out of it. So that's awesome. Yeah. Has anyone else found something like that that's like been super helpful in their journey of faith? So I actually have a friend at uh, my college, and he was a Protestant, and he we do have this group called uh, SPIRT, it's the St. Francis Youth Retreat Team, and we coordinate retreats for local middle schools and high schools, and he was in it, and he was Protestant at the time, but he was a better practicing class, like Catholic than most Catholics that went to my church, and so he led one of the retreats, and in his like talks, he would say, you might be wondering why a Protestant is leading a Catholic retreat right now. But I thought it was interesting how you were a Protestant at first, too. Okay. And he's, Catholic, he's Catholic now. Oh, he's Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> he's Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I'll meet a lot of like Catholics, and they'll be like, oh, I'm not a con. Or like, I was a cradle Catholic, like as if that's boring. And it's like, dude, you were, you, like, you were in your mother's womb when she received the Eucharist. Like, that is so cool. <laughs> like, you received the Eucharist an extra 10 years over me. It wasn't until I was 22. Like, you, you did it when you were, what, eight? Like, that's awesome. That's more than 10 years. I'm bad at math, too. <laughs> I was not popular, and I'm not good at math. But <laughs> Anything else? We're practicing that silence. Yeah. I guess, I guess that uh, question. Well, I guess it's not even a question. I guess it is. But uh, do you have any like advice on, say, like I went to a Catholic university, but a lot of it, a lot of the students there were just there for athletics or mm -hmm. non-Catholic studies, and um, I saw a lot of people kind of get sucked into the secular lifestyle. I was wondering if you had any advice on how to really you know, combat that, I guess, yeah. in, your, in college. That's a great question, because it is so hard when the secular world is right there and you're living in the midst of it. And like you said, even at a Catholic college, it's, it's there. There are a couple things that 
that I recommend. One is to read great Catholic books. Like, Bible, first and foremost, but like other great Catholic books that just like strengthen your faith, that help you better understand. Because sometimes there are things that Catholics believe that's like, I don't really know why we believe that. I don't really get it. And so I think reading great Catholic books is a fantastic way to really strengthen your faith. So you guys all got a book tonight coming here. I also brought some books from Dynamic Catholic that are on the table. If you want them as you leave, no, no pressure or whatever. But I think reading great Catholic books, find, find something that really speaks to you. I think there are also ways that you can just like live out your faith and, and live it loud and proud, right? Like if you wear a cross necklace, like rock that thing. If you, you know, don't worry about what people are going to think about you if you say grace before eating food in the dining hall, right? Because you're going to attract that. People are going to see you. Man, when I see someone cross themselves before eating in a restaurant, I would like, want to be like their best friend. I want to go up and be like, hi. <laughs> like, I love that. I think it's great. It's so attractive. When someone's truly living out their faith, it's so attractive. And so I think finding a cohort of people who are like that, attracting people who are like that, being proud and remembering who you are and also whose you are. Right, like I, at one point in college, my friends talked me into going to a party and it was at this bar and they're like, hey, you gotta come, you gotta come. And I was like, oh, I'm not really all about that. They're like, you gotta come, you gotta come. So. We go to this bar and we go to enter and I re they don't let me in because I realize I don't have my ID. And my friends are like, Lindsay, you're so stupid. You didn't know you need to bring your ID to get into a bar. I'm like, I've, no, I've never done this before, so no. So we had to drive all the way back, get my ID, and go all the way back. And then reflecting on it later, I realized, like, I forgot my ID. I forgot my identity. I forgot who I was in going to that party. And so I think one of the things is remaining firm in what you believe and who you are. Does that help? Great. All right. If you have other questions after, please don't hesitate to come talk to me. I like talking, clearly. Um, but I, I know we want to get started with adoration. So I want to close with one thought here, and it's about salmon. So if you're familiar at all, I don't know if you know about the salmon run. But salmon are actually born in freshwater streams, and then they travel to saltwater oceans where they live for the next five to seven years. And then when salmon realize they're going to die, they get ready to move. It's kind of like when old people move down to Florida. But, it's <laughs> <laughs> but the cool thing about salmon is that they actually travel back to the exact freshwater stream where they were spawned. So they make this thousand mile journey. It takes several years, and a lot of salmon don't make it. They actually call it en route mortality. And the salmon has to go all the way back, and they use this thing called geomagnetic homing, which is like a GPS thing under their gill that God gave them, which is super awesome, and like an intense sense of smell. And they have to overcome so many obstacles. They have to jump 12-foot waterfalls. There's eagles, there's bears, there's all these things trying to stop these salmon from getting home. But they push, and they fight, and in the words of Dory, they just keep swimming. <laughs> and guys, we're a lot like salmon, right? Right now, we are in our salt water ocean, but this is not, this is not our ultimate home. This is not our ultimate home that is stamped in our hearts. And God has given us this geomagnetic homing, this, this, this thing in our heart that shows us where we truly belong. And what we need to do is we need to just keep pushing, just keep fighting, just keep swimming, keep reading, keep praying, keep going and receiving the sacraments, and we'll get the strength to get there. Right? I, I referenced the Bread of Life discourse earlier, but one of the things that people don't focus on is what happens just three verses before. Three verses before Jesus starts his Bread of Life discourse. It's when the disciples are in the boat and the sea is all kinds of crazy, and they look out and Jesus is, is standing out there. And in verse 22 it says, Jesus said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land where they were going. They received Jesus into their boat. They received his invitation. They received him into their boat, and immediately he brought them to where they were going. He brought them through those stormy waters. College, life after college, 
it is such an incredible time that there are so many waves crashing against your guys' boat. There's decisions, there's changes, there's careers, there's relationships, there's all this stuff, and the seas can the seas can get so so stormy, so so rampant. But if you look out, if you take off the blindfold and you look out, Jesus is standing right there, his arms wide open, waiting for an invitation to get in your boat. And if we, as the salmon of this world, can let him in our boat, he's going to take us right away to those home waters. So in a couple minutes, we are going to go to adoration. Because he's not only waiting out there in these stormy seas, he's waiting right in there for us. And when we go, I encourage you to just draw your strength from him. Have that time of silence. Have that time of prayer. And let him into your boat. Keep him as your guiding light. Keep your eyes fixed on him and just keep swimming. Through college, after college. Because if we use him as our source of strength and sustenance, there is nothing that we can't handle because we have him in our boat with us. So let's close in a quick prayer. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, I thank you for all these incredible people, for these amazing young adults, Lord, whom you have called because you love them. Lord God, there are people in this room who are dealing with struggles that are so deep, that penetrate their hearts, that, that maybe no one else knows about, God, but you do. Because you do not leave us abandoned. God, Help us remove the blindfold. Help us dance to the music. Help us take time in the classroom of silence. Grant that we may not have good friends, but friends that are good. And grant that we may be that source of support and strength to others around us. Lord, give us the opportunities to receive your grace, to receive your healing, to receive your strength through the sacraments of confession and the Eucharist. Lord, above all, help us keep our eyes fixed on you when so much in life is competing for our attention, when so much in life is competing for our hearts. Help us block out the noise, block out the distractions. And as we go tonight and we fix our eyes on you, Lord, may we be strengthened to do so beyond tonight. In the name of the Father and the Son, Lord. Let's go see Jesus.